And in what appears to have been a preemptive move, the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police have dismantled an encampment of pro-Palestinian protesters at George Washington University. This morning's swift action occurred just hours before both D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser and the police chief in Washington were slated to testify before the House Oversight Committee regarding their management of the protests. Delving deeper into this development is our Washington correspondent, Louise Martinez. At approximately 3.30 in the morning, Metropolitan Police of D.C. cleared an illegal encampment of pro-Palestinian protesters that had been occupying parts of the George Washington University campus since April 25th. According to Metropolitan Police Chief Pamela Smith, it was elements that they detected since last Thursday that prompted authorities to take action. But over the past few days, we began to see an escalation in the volatility of the protests at GW. This started last Thursday when a campus, GW campus police officer was pushed by protesters. According to Metropolitan Police Chief Pamela A. Smith, it was elements detected after last Thursday that prompted authorities to take action. But it's worth noting that George Washington University president had sent last week a letter to D.C. officials requesting assistance in clearing the illegal encampment. On Monday, MPD learned of more indicators that the protest was becoming more volatile and less stable. This included a simple assault reported to GW police, security probing of a GW building, indicators that counter demonstrators were covertly in the encampment, and information that protesters from other schools were traveling to GW. 33 people were arrested, 29 for trespassing and four for assaulting police officers. When pressed whether the scheduled deposition before Congress played any part in the decision making of DC authorities, this is what they had to say. It did not. Um, all the decisions that I've made is based on public safety. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with Chairman uh, Comer uh, this morning, and he expressed his interest in making sure the city and the chief could focus on this ongoing operation. In a statement Wednesday morning, Chairman of the House Oversight Committee, Congressman James Comer, said he was pleased that the actions of the committee had forced D.C. officials to take action. Congressman Comer also confirmed that the scheduled hearing to depose D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser and Metropolitan Police Chief Pema A. Smith had been canceled. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. With multiple arrests at George Washington University early this morning, what are students and eyewitnesses saying about the tumultuous events of the past two weeks? NTD Sam Wong took to the streets to gather insights from passersby. We're here on the campus of George Washington University, and this is about as close as we can get to where the encampments and arrests took place. So right now, as you can see behind the barricades, police remain very much on duty. So just to bring you back to what happened overnight, police began clearing out the encampments at around 3.30 a.m. this morning, and they have so far arrested 33 demonstrators. Now I spoke to some students at the university to find out what they think about the unrest that took place in the last two weeks. What do you think about the arrest that took place overnight? Do you think it's long overdue or do you think it should have never happened? Um, I'm just, I don't think it necessarily should have never happened. I'd say the level of violence definitely wasn't at a point where like arrests were necessary. I'm for it. Arrest them. I think prior to this happening, it was very peaceful. It was totally like fine within their First Amendment right. But then if like it escalated, then I agree that there should be some sort of de-escalation going on. Cops basically invaded the encampment in the middle of the night while everybody was sleeping. I feel as though that's kind of like universally seen as a very cowardly move. I'm sad that it happened, people shouldn't get hurt, but I see both sides. Uh, just to think back for a little bit, do you think it was mostly peaceful? Do you think there were certainly moments where it could have escalated to something that's a lot worth? It was mostly peaceful. I remember one time they uh, put the barricades up and made like a little shrine, it was kind of dope. They're vandalizing the property, it's, uh, they're not changing anything and uh, I think that if they have something to contribute, they should go get a job and then donate the money to their cause that they're fighting for. When they had the statue of George Washington and they put the Palestinian flag over his face, that was like a, a, a bugaboo for a lot of old people like me. And as we take a closer look at today's congressional hearing on protecting Jewish students in K-12 districts, concerns are still high. Joining us from the Capitol are Congressman Burgess Owens of Utah and Alex Nestor, investigative fellow at Parents Defending Education. 
Congressman Burgess Owens and Alex Nestor, thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, Congressman, with regard to the concerning rise of anti-Semitic incidents in K through 12 schools nationwide, uh, from bias curricula to vandalism to protests, this issue garnering national attention, prompting congressional hearings, can you share with us the current situation and its impact on our education system? Well, first of all, it's a great opportunity to talk with you. Uh, this is a wake-up call. Uh, you know, our country has always had a, a, a culture, law and order, a respect, a vision, uh, appreciation. And we're seeing that uh, over the last, I said, few decades, we've been changing that. And this is just kind of, we're seeing it come to, to a head. Um, we're seeing a, a, a sense of, of, of hatred that I have not seen since I was in high school. I grew up in the deep south in Tallahassee, Florida, KKK, Jim Crow, and segregation. And this is exactly where we are here in 2024. The difference is, it's being trained and taught through our school system, our educational system. The slow march of Marxism that started in the 1930s, we're now seeing what that looks like. We have kids that are growing up, they're young, and they have no idea what respect is, have no idea what it is not to, not to hate, they just think it's, it's easy. So we have to address it and make sure we're stopping this uh, indoctrination, make sure our kids get back to what we've always believed in an American dream. Alex, how can parents effecti effectively address these instances of anti-Semitic uh, lessons in curriculum and the, the programming in their children's schools, especially considering the bureaucratic challenges they often face? Parents Defending Education, we brought in roughly 30 parents uh, to Congress today, to this hearing. That's, the best thing that parents can do is speak up, to be in the room, to, to know what's going on in their kids' schools, and to say something about it. When they see DEI, when they see divisive race ideology in their kids' classrooms, they need to speak up about it. That's the only way that we can actually take action. We have to know what's going on in schools. And it's great to see parents doing that, like the ones who came uh, to the Capitol today. Can I, add, can I add to that? Uh, it truly is engagement. Uh, the most powerful three words in the history of mankind is we the people. And once we the people begin to have conversations, and it doesn't matter what side of the aisle we sit on, we want our kids to grow, to prosper, to be positive, to get rid of any kind of hate. And to do that, we have to recognize it, be engaged as parents, be engaged uh, uh, in, in every level of, 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 uh, of leadership. And, uh, and, and we're going to do the same thing here in, in the House. We have a House majority right now. Uh, we're not going to let this go through. It's going to be accountability for outcome. And uh, we look forward to being part of that conversation. Congressman, what do you anticipate will come of these hearings? Do you think that school officials and board members will face potential resignations as a result of the spotlight on uh, some of this anti-Semitic uh, behavior happening in schools? We're going to continue to do our best. Uh, at the end of the day, the things that we have control of, uh, not so much, we don't have control of what, how the district is going to deal with this, how the school system will deal with it. We have control of the purse. Uh, we can fund or defund. We can uh, begin to put in legislation that, that is predicated on outcome. And that's really what our long game is. Uh, this has been going on for way, way too long. It's not going to happen overnight. For us to be able to be, be, be in a position to have these conversations is a big deal, and I want to thank the American people for giving the Republican Party a small majority because that's the only way this is happening. But once we have the conversation, then how do we legislate? How do we make sure that this never happens again? And those who are bigots uh, get fired. Not just move, by the way, many of these guys, they just move to another place, another school. We need to have a way of accountability that when people do bad things for our kids, they get fired and do something else. So we're looking at, at how to address that. Alex, are there any signs that some of this anti-Semitism in our schools is indicative of a coordinated effort to radicalize young people? Yeah, I mean, look, that's a great question. I think it's just part of this much broader effort to push divisive race ideology in our schools. Anti-Semitism is a fixture of that in schools. It's not a flaw. This is something that, whether it's through ethnic studies, whether it's through you know lowering history standards, when kids aren't taught the truth about history, this is the result. This is what happens. So whether or not it's you know fully coordinated, that's a really big question. But we do know when people are pushing this liberated ethnic studies model um, or other you know, types of divisive race ideology in schools. That's what's happening and we are seeing that in districts across the country and it's horrifying. Congressman Owens, Alex Nestor, thank you both so much for joining. Thank you thank so you. much, appreciate it. In Georgia, the legal battle continues as a state appeals court prepares to hear former President Trump's appeal of the disqualification ruling in the Fannie Willis case. Today, the court granting Trump the opportunity to file his appeal within the next 10 days. NTD's legal correspondent Arlene Richards brings us the latest developments.
I'm here with the prosecutors and investigators. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis is on notice that her victory in a Georgia Superior Court is not final. The Georgia Court of Appeals on Wednesday granted the Trump team's request for an appeal. The request stems from the lower court's decision to not disqualify Willis. Judge Scott McAfee said there was an appearance of impropriety, but that defense attorneys had not proven there was a conflict. The embattled district attorney was accused of creating a conflict of interest over her personal relationship with former special prosecutor Nathan Wade. Wade resigned as a result of the judge's order, but Willis was permitted to stay on the case. Trump's attorney, Stephen Sadow, applauded the appeals court decision, saying the former president looks forward to arguing before the appeals court. Sadow said the case should ultimately be dismissed. A decision by the appeals court could take months. In Florida, another Trump criminal trial is being delayed. Judge Eileen Cannon on Tuesday ordered that the trial be reset by a separate order following the resolution of the matters before the court. She wrote that there was a myriad of trial and classified document issues pending that required her to delay the trial. Senate Democrats think Cannon's handling of the case is questionable. She's taken a course of action which was unexpected. There are increasing well-justified doubts about the ability and the experience that this judge should have to deal with this kind of challenging case. The ruling comes days after special counsel Jack Smith admitted in a court filing that the order of papers in some of the boxes seized by FBI agents had been changed. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at EpochTV.com.